Goldfields reported a 15% increase in its second quarter adjusted headline earnings per share. Eleni Jockos caught up with the company's CEO Nick Holland and started by asking him about cost pressures. If you strip out the electricity increase that was imposed with effect from 1st of April, together with one month of uh, winter tariffs, because there is a differential tariff in winter compared to summer, our costs would have only gone up 1% uh, in gross terms. And in fact, our cash costs in unit terms would have gone down. So it's really all isolated in the electricity increases. We managed to hold all of our other costs flat, uh, well controlled, very happy with what everyone's doing. And as we've been saying for quite some time, 27% increase in electricity costs year after year is going to have an impact. On Does this mean you cost. have to work harder, though, to try and get your costs down even further to mitigate the it increase does. in electricity costs? It does, and that's why we're focusing on all of the other cost elements to make sure we can try and eat as much inflation as we can in those costs. But also in electricity, we're looking at reducing our consumption. We've dropped our consumption by 14% over the last three years, and I believe that we have to do the same again over the next three years, and including re-engineering how we actually operate. So that'll be the next big focus. What's well, also quite fascinating, in the first half of 2008, your South African operations are made up around 63% of uh, revenue and profits. And just taking a look at where we stand today in the first half of this year, only making up 47%. So clearly your international operations are having more of an impact uh, on your business. Is there any kind of talk or thought to split the two operations? I know that the investor community has been asking about this for quite some time. No, and I think firstly, the split in our international and SA production is in line with our strategy. It's purely an execution of our strategy whereby we want to create a truly global company. The international production base now on an annualized basis is almost 2 million ounces a year compared to 1.4 million ounces three years ago when I got into this job. And that's clearly in line with what we wanted to achieve. We don't believe that there's any value at this stage to be derived by uh, splitting the, the assets into two separate entities. Let's look at the opportunities ahead. Uh, I know that a lot of people are also quite excited about the prospects uh, for your Arctic Platinum project, uh, which we know is still currently undergoing feasibility. What's the update on that? And are you still on target for, I think, towards the end of next year when we could expect production or decision to be made? Absolutely. We are at the moment in a critical stage of doing metallurgical test work on a new hydro metallurgical process called Platsol, which uh, using autoclaves, which is a pressure oxidation process, enables us to produce the metals on site as opposed to a concentrate. And by doing that, we're able to improve the recoveries of those metals. And that uh, creates a real step change in the economics of that project. And if you overlay on top of that, of course, the, the price deck in gold, palladium, platinum, nickel, copper then this project is really looking exciting. So I would hope that we'll confirm our metallurgical test work results that we did in the lab on the pilot plant uh, basis, which is a larger scale by October. We'll get into a feasibility study early next year. And I'm very confident that this project could be something that uh, Goldfields could end up uh, making a construction decision on before the end of next year. Okay, taking a look at the strike action that um, uh, hit the country, and we know that it's something that we had grapple with on a year-to-year -year basis. Tell us about the impact it's going to have on production, and uh, we know that your production, you're basically halfway with regards to your targets, so you've still got the second half of the year to meet your, your targets overall. Yeah, look, the strike obviously has not just caused a loss of production during the strike itself, but unfortunately there's always a ramp down, you know, particularly when the strike notice was issued three days beforehand, and of course a ramp back up when we get everyone back to production. So we lose more than just the days of the strike. There was about four or five days of the strike overall, but the impact is larger. So overall I would think that we're going to lose around a ton of gold uh, because of the strike uh, in our operations uh, this particular quarter. But the good news is the gold hasn't gone. You know, we can still mine it, and who knows, maybe we'll mine it at a higher price in future. And, of course, I mean, well, speaking of the gold price at this point in time, we're very close to $1,800 an ounce. We know that there's uh, the debt overhang that is plaguing investors, and it seems that gold, and we know the Swiss franc, of course, are viewed as safe havens. Do you think that this, these kind of levels are sustainable, and any thinking behind hedging at these kind of levels for you? Well, let me put it to you this way. 
I think everyone who wants to really learn about the gold industry should visit India and China because 40% of the world's gold demand, in fact it's almost 45% today, comes out of those two countries. And those investors are really interested in buying the physical. It's not buying the ETF, it's the physical that really is attractive to them. And for me what's really telling over the last two years or so is that notwithstanding the big increase we've seen in price, we've still seen an increase in the offtake as well. So they've bought into a rising price. That's a very, very positive sign. And in India, we haven't seen that in the decade or so before that. Uh, so for me, that's probably going to be the, the biggest underpin of the gold price. And also, two economies that are probably the, uh, the largest growing economies in the world today with a strong affinity to gold. So I'm cautiously optimistic that um, we shouldn't see a regression uh, way back to you know, 1,000 or 1,100 or so. I think we are in a new, in a new structural uh, level for gold. But as always, it's, it's very difficult to predict what it might be. With regards to your projects going forward, we know Peru, Mali and the Philippines uh, offer a lot of excitement. And of course, as I mentioned, Finland as well. Which projects are you most optimistic about going forward? Well, uh, certainly Arctic Platinum we've talked about, but let's not forget about a brownfields expansion in Ghana called Greater Demang, whereby we have the potential to expand an existing pit and triple the size of that pit. And uh, the drilling results so far are so encouraging that in fact I've put out a target of a fourfold increase in the Demang pit reserves from a million ounces to four million ounces. And we're hoping to have that on our balance sheet uh, in the next six months or so. So that's another very exciting project uh, which we could make a decision on as well before the end of next year. And these sort of timeframes to make investment decisions in mining ventures are very short, so it's not far away.